Mr. Pratt is the uh, executive director of the uh, Gun Owners of America and uh, has been for 30 years, or more than 30 years. It's a national membership organization and there are uh, blue uh, membership applications on the table back there. And the books that we mentioned uh, are authored by Mr. Pratt. And he's, the donation for those is $10. Uh, donation on the t-shirts and hats is $2 or $3, whatever you uh, care to give. Um, I'm going to turn the meeting over to Larry now. He's uh, probably a far better speaker than I am, and uh, we're happy to have him. Please give a round of applause to Larry Pratt. Thank you so much for coming out tonight. I know there are a lot of other things you could have been doing. Appreciate your interest. We've been involved as a country in a quite a battle over what the future of America is going to be. The jury is still out. Uh, it's being fought day by day, minute by minute, in the Congress. Of course, I'm talking about uh, the plan to socialize American medicine, which came very, very, very close to making it across the finish line. Uh, we just may be stopping it. We've been active in this because there, this may be entitled a health bill, but it's such an enormous power grab. Gun owners are also affected. The invasion of privacy. The assumption that the government has the right to just haul through any and all of our records to see who ought to be disqualified from owning a gun based on health records uh, is a very serious problem. Uh, we uh, have been involved in fighting Obamacare, or zero care as I prefer to call it, uh, from the very beginning because we saw this threat to our liberty in general and in, to our Second Amendment and freedoms in particular. The, um, when you think about it, the, the, we, we see the ruling class mentality uh, so entrenched that when they're called out on it, they really look like a deer in the headlight. Uh, just, what are you talking about? The, um, it's interesting that the um, the ruling class defenders have included among them in this country people with a decidedly British accent, yeah. which I think is very good because it reminds us of why we're no longer British. Uh, it reminds us of George III and the tremendous difficulty we had dislodging ourselves from that parasite. And when somebody like Piers Morgan tries to lecture us on why we should have never left the empire, uh, that doesn't go down real well, and particularly with his British accent. Um, a guy that sounded just like him was a, maybe still is, a British member of Parliament, a conservative, a Tory, which over there is probably a, maybe a moderate Democrat here, probably a little bit to the left of that. And uh, this was in 1996, right before they enacted their very, very draconian gun law, banning almost everything. And we were going at it over CNN International, so I probably wasn't seen anywhere in the United States, but in airports and hotels around the world, I guess was our audience. But anyway, um, I gave this grid a warning. I said, if you go through with this piece of legislation that you're defending here today, you're going to find your problem's going to get worse. And I told him about Dr. John Lott and his research and how when you uh, encourage people to go about armed, crime goes down, violent crime particularly goes down. Criminals get to work. This is not a workplace that's a safe environment. Uh, whereas the converse is also the case. Fewer guns, more crime. And when I told him that, he said, oh, I say anybody that would say that would go. We'd say it's quite flaky. I know you would, that's why we're no longer British. <laughs> it, um, and then along comes Piers Morgan, and 
the same British accent, the same lecturing uh, that we really ought to disarm ourselves. Well, while admittedly they have a very low murder rate, uh, not as low, by the way, as my Fairfax County, Virginia, which is guns are us, kind of like right in this area, uh, where it's easy to get a gun and carry a gun and all that. Um, our murder rate is one per 100,000. England's is 1.7. So that, that's part of the story. The rest of the story is that their violent crime rate puts them at the fourth most violent country in the world. So they have set the table for the criminals. The criminals have come in and stolen silverware and probably the table as well. So it's, it's not working out. It never does work out. And yet we continue to have to fight these battles because the socialists of the world that want to control everything uh, certainly want to control guns. The idea that we can walk about freely with guns really upsets them. And actually, it was designed to upset people just like that. They're supposed to be concerned about our guns. That's what keeps their hands off our money, off our property, and off our freedom. So we, uh, we like them being upset. We shouldn't apologize for the fact that they are upset. Um, that's part of the whole idea. Now, you have a senator that used to be a conservative. I came up here after he had Senator, now Senator Toomey had served in the House of Representatives and he had a very good voting record and had been very pro Second Amendment. And I came up and campaigned in his uh, effort to get into the United States Senate. Well, I repent of that. I will be up here during his next primary, Lord will. But I won't be doing the same that I was doing the first time. I'll be trying to come to you. Every once in a while, we do make a mistake in evaluating somebody's character. One of our major ways of identifying whether a politician has a backbone is will he stand up against the establishment? particularly in his own party. Well, he had done that. He was running against a sitting Republican senator in that primary. And we thought, you know, that's a pretty good sign. Well, it wasn't a sign enough. Uh, so we will have some scores to settle, and we're hoping that we'll be able to do that. Um, the, the outrageous thing is that he was carried a bill that would have, in effect, topped off the federal government's illegal registration list of gun owners in this country. A list they illegally compile when we go through background checks to purchase firearms. Now, I understand the law says they're not allowed to make a registration list out of that. Well, the NSA wasn't allowed to listen in on our phone calls either and to record all of them. Now, if they will break the law in something like listening to Aunt Susie talk to Sally, do you think they might break the law regarding guns? I think so. And so we're, we're determined that not only are they not going to get something like Toomey through, happily, we were able to stop it, uh, but we want to undo that whole instant background check. It produced 40 prosecutions. I don't even know how many were successful. Last, the last year we had data out of some 11 million background checks processed. It was not a crime fighting tool. Obviously, it has another purpose. The NSA has made it so that I'm not uh, making this up. We know that the government is that disreputable. They've proven themselves not worthy of our trust. They're the ones that we ought to be doing background checks on, not us. <laughs> I'd like to give you a little inside baseball on how the Toomey bill was stopped. Um, there's two giants in the United States Senate. Senator Mike Lee had a meeting in his conference room toward the end of July, to which he invited eight other senators, including Senator Cruz 
and some 40 folks like me who head up various conservative organizations in Washington who had been actively involved already in opposing zero theory for the various reasons that their organizations had objections to. And the, the meeting, as far as I can tell, was probably unprecedented. Certainly, I hadn't seen one like that while I've been in Washington, and that's been a few years. The senators were lobbying the lobbyists. They invited us to come in to hear them make a pitch to go out and beat Obamacare, zero care. Uh, and they gave their reasons, uh, and they invited each one of us to indicate what it was, that we, how we saw it, and what we might be able to do. Uh, they wanted action, uh, which was a, another thing that's unusual about a lot of things. Uh, it's one thing to come and, and hear about something, but uh, to actually get uh, the request to go out and do something about it was, I thought, very encouraging. And I, my admiration for those two guys continues to grow. Something that I only learned a couple of weeks ago, and I think you might be interested, is we have Senator Mike Lee to thank for Ted Cruz being a United States Senator. Uh, in early 11, Lee had just been elected to the Senate. It was some kind of conservative meeting in Washington. I, I, I wasn't told what it was. It was too secret to tell. Anyway, uh, Cruz was there as the Solicitor General of the state, and Lee was taken with Ted Cruz, and on the spot began to lobby him to run for the U.S. Senate. So not only does Senator Lee do a lot in his own right, uh, we also have him to thank for having put, in, put the idea in uh, Cruz's head to go and run. And um, I can't tell you how glad I am that he ended up doing what he's done because he has begun to change the culture in Washington. As I wish I could remember to give them credit that somebody in a blog wrote just this week that Ted Cruz, in effect, is the Speaker of the House. He went right, up, literally, physically to the House, made a lot of phone calls, and he just took it right away from John Boehner, who was last seen crying in his handkerchief. <laughs> He's really a sad sack, and I think his days are numbered as speaker and probably as congressman. He has been totally humiliated. Everybody understands that Ted Cruz runs the United States House with a band of some 50 conservatives who were able to bull their caucus into uh, that direction that they, that they took when they voted unanimously, which really shocked me, uh, to defund Obamacare, zero care. Uh, I think we are 50-50 chance of actually pulling this monstrosity down at least for a year. And as we get used to not having it and people continue to report how I lost my job, how my hours got shrunk, how I lost my insurance, the uh, president said I would not lose, all of these things, not to mention the threat to gun owners, um, are going to be more and more evident to more and more people as we have the time to have the debate and have the discussion that did not occur under the rather conniving fashion that was used to get the bill enacted to begin with. Um, not much is said right now about Fast and Furious, and that's something that I would suggest you could encourage your congressman to ask uh, the leadership. I mean, the House, why isn't anything being done? Why aren't hearings being held? Why isn't there prosecution based on the criminal contempt finding of the House of Representatives that was voted for about a year ago? The charge, that became an indictment, and it was presented to the D.C. Federal Court, where it now reposes uh, anesthetized, not moving. Maybe it doesn't even have a pulse. I don't know. Uh, but that's outrageous, and members of Congress need to stir this up. They need to be poking the court. And there's one way to get a court's attention, you know. They do have the purse in Congress for that very reason. So they could uh, say, you either get moving on this, or if you apparently <coughs> don't want to move on it, we'll just take your money away. And uh, you, uh, if you want to come to work for free, that'd be fine, but we're not going to pay you. 
that might get their attention. And it really should, because there's been a monster cover up of what has happened and what it had happened in Fast and Furious. People were being told to put guns into the hands of criminals. And then, of course, what happened in Benghazi was kind of a, an international version of Fast and Furious. Turns out we were running guns to Al Qaeda in Syria. How goofy is that? Why we were even involved at all in Syria, where there are no good guns. Just stay at home and let them fight it out themselves. Uh, if you're giving guns, make sure you give them to the side that's about to lose so they can keep fighting for a while longer. But you know, to try to pick a favorite over there, that's crazy. Um, the UN treaty's been signed by the president, but you know, as much as I would like to and you send money to gun or so we can fight that. That's not going anywhere in the Senate. Uh, the senators realized they would be toast if they voted for the UN. If there is one thing that unites, I think, a majority of Americans is a thorough loathing of the UN. The facilitator of tyrants, the, the, the folks that actually assisted in the genocide in Rwanda, uh, these people are so murderous and despicable that we ought to get them out of the United States. At least we can do that and stop paying their salaries. The, um, a lot of times, the defense of our freedom is not being effectively carried out in Washington, and sometimes in state capitals. But where we are seeing a, a rising movement, a spreading movement, is at the county, sometimes with county commissioners, often uh, also with sheriffs. And you were discussing that uh, earlier. This is going on right here in River City, where your council is hopefully going to uh, take this step and put up that legal line telling the feds, don't cross it, or we're going to cross you. Um, don't come into our county if you have unconstitutional motives. And uh, they don't like to hear that, but so far, they have never gone against a county and or a sheriff that have taken that position. One of my favorite uh, accounts uh, is a guy who I would say is a friend of mine now. He's since joined the GOA, since we first met at a conference, Sheriff Brad Rogers, the sheriff of Elkhart County, Indiana. Uh, about two years ago, Sheriff Rogers was approached by a farmer. Uh, interestingly, that's kind of an Amish area out there, even as it is here. And uh, so it was with this farmer. Uh, so almost certainly he hadn't voted for uh, Sheriff Rogers, but no vote. Well, he probably has a fondness for Sheriff Rogers now. He went to the sheriff's office and explained that he was being hassled with repeated inspections by the FDA at his raw milk dairy. I don't know what it is about the FDA, but they just can't stand the idea that we're drinking milk the way people have drunk it since Adam and Eve milked the first cow. <laughs> Just the government's got to be there and they've got to tell you to do things that are probably actually uh, more dangerous than any risk that you have from drinking raw milk. So anyway, uh, Rogers, uh, just as a freedom sort of guy, was sympathetic, but to cover himself, he went out to the farm to make sure it wasn't a little house of horrors with dead animals stinking all over the place. But no, of course, it was a very well-run, beautiful, spotless operation. So he went back to his office and he sent an email to the EPA, uh, to the head attorney, and said, uh, I've been out to the uh, farmer's property. Uh, it's a magnificent operation. You set one more foot on his land and I'm putting him in my jail. And uh, she wrote back and said, well, if you try that, we'll arrest you. And his response immediately was to the effect, game on. It was two years ago. <clears throat> and that raw milk is still being produced. Now, if it hadn't been for Sheriff Rogers and his understanding that 
foods and drugs are not in Article I, Section 8, which empowers the federal government to do almost everything it is supposed to do, um, it could have turned out differently because around the same time, up in Wisconsin, another farmer producing raw milk had a completely different experience. The sheriff just stood by while the state DNR came in and stole all his equipment, put him out of business, bankrupted him. So a county sheriff is truly an effective bastion for the defense of our liberties, and it really matters who we elect for sheriff, and it really matters if he understands the constitutional obligations he has to interpose himself between out-of-control state and or federal government. He can do it, he should do it. And if uh, you have a sheriff that's not quite sure about that, you can get a, in fact, I, I think we may have some copies on the table I might have brought, uh, called the County Sheriff, written by Sheriff Richard Mack, former sheriff of Graham County, and has become the uh, leading spokesman in this country for interposition by the county sheriff to protect the people of the county from thugs with badges coming, from, especially from the federal level. Um, I could tell you about other sheriffs like Brad Rogers. The good news is that there are many of them and they have taken action whether it was to protect people cutting down national forest trees to protect the village from forest fire, or keeping the feds from refusing the delivery of ice to the victims after Katrina. There's one sheriff in the southern Mississippi County just had his deputies climb up on these rigs. The federal government, for whatever reason, had these 18 wheelers how many of them, quite a few, uh, just compounded at, at a federal facility without going all the way to the coast to deliver the ice. And we couldn't find any explanation for why they were going to do it, why they were doing it, why they weren't going to go the rest of the way. So he said, uh, guys, to his deputies, cover me uh, and, and the rest of us as they climbed up into the cabs and drove off. They didn't try to impede us arrest them. And uh, he's in court right now. Feds took him to court over that. I think he's probably going to win because of Sheriff Mack. Sheriff Mack took the Brady Law to court when it still required sheriffs to do a background check. This is before the horror of the instant background check and the ability to keep a national gun registry of everybody buying a gun at the store. And Sheriff Mack's, he didn't win in overturning the entire Brady Law, but he did establish, he did renew life in the Tenth Amendment, it's, it, which basically says the feds can't tell a state official what to do. It's in other places in the Constitution as well, and not unless there's explicit authority given to the federal government. And again, in, in food and drugs, no. And for that matter, police work. The federal government actually has no authority to do police work. That's all at the federal, at the state and the and the local level. And it's a great unconstitutional presumption for the federal government to have FBI. I, I can see the, the protective service of the Secret Service. That's that's a bodyguard service. I get that. But the rest of it, no. They do not have constitutional authority to act in those areas, let alone to have police authority in those areas. The Department of Education had a SWAT team outside some or California woman's domicile because she was behind on her college tuition loan. This is nuts. There was a man killed in the county south of me who was accused of being involved in numbers. And a SWAT team, guns drawn, fingers on triggers, approached this guy's house and killed him on the way up so they were a little too eager to play war. It's got to stop. SWAT teams should be made illegal unless there's a life-threatening situation. To serve a warrant for some idiot playing the numbers? Oh, please. About 30 years ago, 35, I was in the state legislature. And I thought it would be a good idea to see what the cop's life was like. So I went around with a cop one morning, about half a, half a day probably. And at one point, probably around 10 in the morning, 
we went to this nice suburban house. He knocked on the door. And eventually, a young man, very sleepy, uh, kind of, I think he might have been dragging a blanket, probably didn't want to sleep on the couch, uh, answered the door. Cop spoke to him briefly and went inside and closed the door. About 10 minutes later, came back out. The young man was dressed. And he took him in and booked him on a drug charge. Now, what a difference in 35 years. You know, a real cop acting the way a real cop should took care of business. And it, unless you'd have been really paying attention in the neighborhood, you wouldn't have noticed a thing. No siren, no lights, no nothing. And, and I didn't even go in with him. He said, you just sit here in the front seat. And uh, when it, he, he never even had his hand that close to his gun. Because he knew this was not likely to be a dangerous situation. I'm sure he was on the alert, but nevertheless, he handled it in such a professional, low-key fashion. That's what real cops still ought to be doing. And uh, the uh, happily, the sheriff is at one of the places where I think we can write this very dangerous direction that police work has taken in too many jurisdictions and remind them. Especially the feds that uh, you may be from the federal government, but you ain't my boss. And uh, that's a lesson that I think many of them really do need to learn. So I think we're making progress. We've finally seen the Republicans get a backbone in the Congress. And they may actually do some damage to zero. I'm not sure I expected to ever see anything like that. But it's, it's happening, and we'll see if they have the resolve to stay the course. Cause they may have to let the government stay at 57% uh, operation, not a shutdown, uh, for seven weeks. And that's going to take uh, a lot of bucking up. So you ought to be regularly pleased in contact with your congressional office here in Washington. And if they're doing the right thing, if they're supporting uh, the slowdown, um, the partial shutdown, uh, tell them, boy, keep it up. Don't look back. Well, let's uh, stop there uh, because the question and answer uh, was supposed to be part of uh, our evening, and I very much enjoyed.